And I mean, that's also a big part I got out of nutrition and into mindset is realizing, oh my God, there, there really is no answer. And then learning to apply that way of being to other areas of your life of like, okay, now I believe this. And as long as I listen to my body, like my weight stabilized, like I know I will never be obese again. I, I truly believe that from the bottom of my heart and I don't even have to think about it. Welcome to the Embrace and Expand podcast where we talk about everything from spirituality, self-development, relationships, mindfulness, wellness, and everything that will help you embrace all that you are so you can expand into the best version of yourself. All right, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Embrace and Expand podcast. So our guest in this episode is a fellow podcaster, coach, and an all-around empowering person. She helps people to activate their bravery, create dreams, and then shift their mindset so that they can truly thrive in their lives. Utilizing human design, she also helps you understand yourself on a deeper level, allowing you the freedom to create a life designed specifically for you. She believes that in order to live this life of true fulfillment, you need commitment in evolving, changing, and growing with the punches. So let me introduce you to the host of Breakthroughs for Breakfast, Rachel Veritmos. Rachel, welcome to the Embrace and Expand podcast. And I hope I didn't just butcher your last name. Oh my God, no, you did a great job. It's Veritmos. I think you said it just about that. The way you pronounce it is so much better than what I hear other people say. I hear Veritamos and Veritamos, so you crushed it. Thanks for having me on, Adam. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, it's wonderful. Well, we were introduced to each other through one of the recent guests on the podcast, Ryan, your significant other. And so I have no doubt that this conversation is going to be just as epic as those with him. Yes. Yes, I'm excited. For those of our listeners that aren't familiar with you and your work, why don't you just take a moment to tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of what got you here? Okay. I always want to make this story as short as possible because it's really a journey that started as young as nine years old. So I'll just describe who I was and we'll skip a lot of the details. But I was a very highly sensitive child who didn't talk, um, grew up in the early 90s. And so imagine I'm like I'm obese. I'm like the only obese kid in my school almost because in the early 90s, obesity was not as much a thing especially for kids. And I always felt different than the other kids. I I didn't talk. I remember I would sit in class and I would watch everyone talk and raise their hand and answer questions. And I would just like not be able to get words out of my mouth. And I would just wonder how they were doing this. And even at recess, I didn't engage in really recess. I would just be very much to myself. Um, I wasn't like a normal child. I went home in a closet eight. I did have like a couple friends when I was in elementary school, but because I just wanted to go home and closet eat and play video games and not be a normal child, I got ditched by like the only two friends I had. And so then I created this story of, I'm just such an outcast and I don't know how to be a normal human and people don't like me. And so at nine years old, I learned about this weight loss camp that was in Maine. It was called Camp Shane. So if anyone has seen the movie Heavyweights, it's based Mm -hmm. off of that particular weight loss camp, Camp Shane in New York. So begged my parents to let me go because I wanted to be a normal kid. I was like, and I thought the reason I wasn't normal was because I was obese. So I was like, let me go. They said, if you go for six weeks, you lose 20 pounds. And my parents were like, fine, go. And I went and I lost 23 pounds and I learned so many unhealthy habits. Like I learned not, if I didn't eat that much, I would lose weight. If I exercised more than other people, I would lose weight. And so I, even at a young age was very competitive and I lost the most weight out of my my bunk mates. And then I just became obsessed with dieting and nutrition and being thin. And at that weight loss camp was the first time I was around other kids who I felt some sort of relation to. Like I was like, oh, they're obese like me. And so I then correlated losing weight with having friends also. And so I spent like the next 16 years being obsessed with nutrition and researching up till 3 a.m., thinking there was something wrong with me, wanting to find the answers, ended up getting my degree in nutrition, went to college because I was so obsessed and I wasn't finding the answers on my own on Mother Google. So I was like, I'll go to college, worked my ass off in college, thought I was going to find the answers. And then college was over and I was more distraught than ever 
because I had learned all of the things at that point about nutrition from the way I thought I could learn, which is research and, you know, studies and things like that. And I still felt so trapped by food and I wasn't solving the root issue, which was the fact that I had like debilitating anxiety and didn't know how to feel my feelings and had low self-esteem and no self-acceptance. And so when you hit a rock bottom after that much research, like I'm sure other people listening can relate and maybe you can relate too. You get to this point of like, I can't anymore. I surrender. I give up. I don't give any shits. I don't know if I can swear on here. But oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so at that point, I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go back to the basics. I know I can have whole foods. Like those are healthy. Like I know basically what's healthy fruits, veggies, protein. I need these things. Um, I, you know, I knew about the basics. So I started eating base basics and I was like, I'm just going to eat when I'm hungry. Stop when I'm full. And I stopped. I would binge a lot before because I would you know, tried to stretch out the time between meals and I would starve myself a little bit and then I would binge a lot, which was a cycle. So I stopped binging and I was like, oh, all I'm doing is listening to when I'm hungry and when I'm full and I'm eating whole foods. And then all of a sudden I had more energy than I'd ever had in my life. Like I was always so exhausted in college and as a kid and I didn't know why I wasn't being properly nourished. And I started to now feel how different foods made me feel. I was no longer thinking about diets. And it was the first moment in my life where I was like, holy shit, my body knows something. Like my body is really smart. Like I, and I was ignoring it this whole time. And all I had to do was get to the surrender point of not giving any fucks anymore. And then I like was at the body weight I'd always tried so hard to be at and I wasn't trying at all. And so that was the first notch on my belt of like, holy crap, I can trust myself and I don't have to think about anything outside of me. How much deeper does this go? Because I still had a lot of social anxiety and terrified of other humans because didn't have that many friends, not talking that much, terrified of women. So I'll just fast forward. I did a whole bunch of stuff, you know, all the therapy, the meditations, all the things nothing really changed or made a big difference until I did Enlifted coaching certification. Do you know about Enlifted, Adam? Mm -mm, I don't. So they're like a mindset coaching certification. They're big on words, language. Me and Ryan had actually heard them on a podcast a couple years before, and that's how we got connected and into it. So I met people in there. They were awesome. That coaching program changed my life. And then there was these women who were going to host a woman's retreat in Oregon. And I thought, that sounds terrifying. I'm terrified of women. I'm going to go do it. <laughs> so I didn't have much money. It was beginning of COVID. I had just quit my job, was starting a business, or not really starting a business, not sure what I'm going to do with my life, go to a retreat. It completely, the women there were so safe and I gained so much value from being in that retreat setting that it completely ripped apart every story I had about women being scary or catty or not liking me. And so then I became obsessed because it felt like another layer of me had been revealed of like truth through experience. So I'm really big on growth through the direct experience of something. Um, so then I attended like a million retreats that year. I spent like 30 grand that year. And in the same time, I lost my job, didn't have the savings to pay for it. The universe supported it the whole way. Every leap I took, every risk I took to invest it for my growth, it supported me. Like it worked out. And every time it blew my mind. And by the end of the year, over the course of like two years, spent a lot of fucking money on retreats and coaching. I felt like a new person. And at that point I had started a coaching business and I had tried to make like teaching intuitive eating work, but I wasn't passionate about it. It was just such an old part of my life. And I was trying to force it because I thought that was the thing I knew how to do, um, which is another thing I now teach. Don't force the shit that you think you should do. Do the things that actually feel fun and exciting. So wasn't making that much money in my business until randomly I had a reading with a psychic and she was telling me about my past life and something about what she said in my past life, this, th this message came in, this thought came in, that means you can host retreats. <laughs> I don't know why I made it mean that. I took the story she said in my past life and decided I can host retreats in this life. So I had been to a lot of retreats at that point. I knew what I liked. I knew what I didn't like. I knew what I felt really worked. And I also had things in my life that I had utilized that got me to this point. So 
I got so excited about hosting this retreat, even though I had like no clients and no proof that it would work, that I put the retreat on my mom's credit card because I didn't have the money to buy the house for the retreat. And she, she was like, okay, I'll trust you. I was so passionate about it that within a month, I filled the whole retreat with 14 people. It was such a life-changing experience. I'm now, I'm now almost on my sixth retreat. But what that taught me was, holy crap, like do the things that make no sense, that just light you up, that like you're so excited about and it will work out. And so then I just did that again and again, you know, the more you become like you dive into your fears and the more you see it work out, you become this like fear junkie. I am not the type of fear junkie who's going to jump out of a plane like fuck that I will not jump out of a plane that's not going to make me better in the way I want to be. But like I'm a fear junkie when it comes to taking risks with investments with things I want to do things I want to create. And I'm like I said, I'm going on my sixth retreat now I've had quite some mess ups and failures. I've definitely lost some money. I've definitely had my ego bruised. But every time it's happened, I've gained even more confidence and so much self worth. And, and so yeah, it's like, I know that's such a long story. But today, I feel very confident. I feel very worthy. I feel like I can do freaking anything. And that's such a far cry away from that girl who didn't talk who didn't think she knew how to be a human. And so I am so big about helping women get to that same place because like, I, I get it. Like I really get when someone thinks that they can't do shit or don't know shit about shit or aren't good enough or aren't worthy or don't know how to be um, the it person. Like I get it, but I also know what's possible for them. And so, so yeah, that's, that's the journey. That's such an incredible journey and such an amazing story and so many things that I resonate with a lot in what you had to say. And I think back on my childhood and and like I had waves of friends throughout childhood. It's almost like I had friends in certain elementary school and I hung out with all of those friends. And then in middle school, it's like you get separated between different classes and all of a sudden you gain new friends and you hang out with them for a while and then you go into high school and the same thing happens and it's like but I never really felt like I truly belonged I always felt like I was trying to conform myself to fit in with that particular group of friends and it wasn't through just like you of having to go through this journey of like self-discovery and go to a bunch of different retreats and take a bunch of different modality courses and meditate all the time and learn Reiki and, and all the things that I started to uncover me. And I started to uncover like, what does it actually mean and look like to be me and how to show up in that and how do I structure life that makes me excited every day to do what it is that I want to do and not just do what society tells me I should do or what I think I should do. And I thought it really interesting and unique that you used the example of you're a fear junkie, but you aren't the type that's going to want to jump out of a plane. That's actually one of the instances that solved a lot of my own fears was jumping out of a plane. Oh my God. Wait, tell me about it. That's so funny. So, when I was 17, I packed parachutes for an entire summer at this place called Skydive Snohomish in my hometown of Snohomish, Washington. And because I was 17 and not 18, I had to get parental consent in order to be able to jump. But both of my parents worked at Boeing at the time. And my dad was like, I helped to put together these planes and make sure that they are good so people don't have to jump out of them. No, I'm not going to sign this for you to be able to jump. So I ended up not ever being able to jump and then life kind of happened, but I still always wanted to have that experience. And then for my 30th birthday, my wife, Rachel, bought me a tandem jump. And so I went back to skydive Snohomish and signed up to do a jump and went up to 13,500 feet. And as soon as that door opened, I was met with this giant wave of fear of what am I doing? Like, this isn't smart. Like, I shouldn't be jumping this far out, but I've got a guy strapped to my back, pushing me towards the door, and I have no choice but to just go out. And I went from that just sheer terror to pure and utter exhilaration like that. 
I'm curious when you came out of it, the exhilaration happened. And then was there like a sense of pride? Like, what did you make it mean about you when you hit the ground? When I hit the ground, I honestly was like, I want to do this. Like, I, I want to I want to get my jumping license. Like, I want to take people through this experience. And I, of course, have a tendency of like when I feel very enlightened emotions, I want to just run with it. But I recognize that like, OK, you know, skydiving, yes, can be a profession, but it's not really one that's going to change a lot of people's lives like it can. It changed mine. I got over my, you know, fears of the dark. I got over all kinds of just little random fears just dissipated, like without even thinking about it, because my consciousness and my awareness and my ego recognized that it survived something that was incredibly terrifying. Mm. And that gave me the power to push through a lot of these fears. Now, there are still some fears that I deal with, like fear of judgment and a little bit of scarcity mentality, imposter syndrome, fear of, you know, what are people going to say when I post certain things? Those are things that I still have to work through and I still have to deal with and I still have to face on somewhat of a regular basis. I kind of believe that those types of fears are just always going to be there. They just lessen over time the more we face them. Just like you said, like the more you start to face those fears, the less power they actually and less control they have over you. Would you mm -hmm. would you kind of agree with that? Like the more that you've kind of put yourself in line with that fear and then just pushed through it, it's given you that power back. I do. I do. I also think it's super important to envelop on experiences like that in a variety of experiences and allow the lessons come as they may like for you after skydiving you're like fuck like now I can do more things and this and that and uh, you know then I've heard people who skydived who was like fuck that hated it never doing it again and you know I actually felt that way I didn't do skydiving but I cliff jumped when I went to a, um, a sleepaway camp when I was younger and it was like 30 feet off the ground it wasn't even that high and I hated it I was like this is why I hate roller coasters I hated this I was like I'll never fucking do that again which is partially where I was like I will never skydive because I know I hate the stomach dropping feeling mm. um but like I think it's important that you have the experience anyways so that you know that you don't like it and you learn more about you and you learn about the things that like turn you on right so so I a thousand percent agree, like an initiation can also look different for so many people. Like for you, it was the skydiving. For me, it was the retreats and the business. And maybe for other people, it's something completely different, right? Like that's the initiation they need. But yeah, no, I a thousand percent agree. And I think that it was such a great example. And that's such the beauty of the journey, right? Is it's like it's unique for every person. There is no one way. And I've had this conversation so many times and I love that you brought up, you know, nutrition because nutrition is a very touchy subject with a lot of people. My wife and I, we've been vegan for 10 years for my body and my wife's body. It works. I know other people who for them, the carnivore diet is what works for their body. And yet there's so many people out there that try to push keto or other certain diets that this is the one and only way if you aren't doing it this way you don't know what you're talking about and whatever else you try just isn't going to work but i think it's unique that we all have to recognize that all of our bodies have different wants and needs and we have to experiment and try and see what works see what doesn't work to develop our own structure in our own way a thousand percent. In addition to that, you know, you'll find something that works. And this is in my experience, too, is you can find something that works, but it's also about not even being overly strict about what works and understanding that your body also shifts and changes throughout life. Like if I think about human evolution, do you know about the blue zones, the studies they've done on mm -hmm. them? The blue zones is really cool because they went out to find like the perfect diet, the diet in areas where people live the longest. And so they went around the world and were like, okay, these people live the longest. What do they eat? These people live really fucking long. What do they eat? And some of the places that had the like longest life expectancy 
ate like red meat, they smoke cigarettes, they drink alcohol. And which is pretty mind blowing that really what the conclusion was, is it came down to reducing stress. And if you think about it, like evolutionarily, wherever your genes are from, like you, you probably grew up or came from an area where they had certain foods. But then I imagine at some point or the other, like one day a new food was introduced and it doesn't mean that food stayed. It just came out of nowhere. Maybe someone traveled from a different country and was like, try this. And And I think that's what I mean by like not being overly strict, but also, yeah, noticing what works for you. Like I can't do vegan. It makes me so nauseous, but I know people who thrive on vegan. So, and I also think the more you understand that and start tuning into your body, like it sounds like you're doing veganism because you know, you feel better on it. You're not Mm -hmm. doing it because of like these rules and these uh, results from this science experiment. Maybe it was introduced to you that way, but like you fact checked it with your own body. And that's where your truth came from, which I think that's like the most empowering piece. Yeah. I mean, it, for, for me, it really started with my wife. She went to Japan and documented the dolphin slaughters that happen in Taiji there every year and came back as a vegan. We were already vegetarian at that point. Um, I was born lactose intolerant, so I've never really had dairy as a staple in my diet. And so it was, she was the one doing all of the grocery shopping and doing all of the cooking. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll just conform this way. And then over time, like when we would go out and eat, I'd still order like chicken or fish and things like that. And then we went out to eat one night and I ordered a chicken enchilada and it destroyed my system. And that was a point where I was like, okay, my body is asking me not to consume this anymore. And so the more and more I started adopting that vegan diet, the better and better I started to feel. My energy levels started to increase. My overall emotional well-being started to increase. And I do contribute that switch to being one of the things that kind of catapulted me on my spiritual awakening because Mm -hmm. I like to explain that type of diet as like you're eating nothing but light. Because all fruits and veggies, nuts and seeds, they all absorb light. They all have light existing with inside of them. Whereas animal products, they don't have that light anymore. Because that light left the moment that their soul left, the moment that their body left. And so for me, it's more of like a a consciousness kind of a thing. Whereas... I know many other people look at it as, say, the Native American culture had the belief that, you know, when they took down a bison, for example, they would take out the heart and they would immediately eat from the heart when they took down that animal, believing that they were taking on the energy, the spirit, the soul, the strength of that animal, then making them that much stronger. So I think part of that whole like eating thing, it's like going into a ceremony, it's intention. It's your belief. It's what your mind thinks that then conforms to your body because all of your cells are being like, okay, I resonate with that. So that's what I'm going to do. Yes. I, I, when it's interesting, you mentioned the spiritual practice because I do believe that eating in a way that works well for you or that you notice you feel better in does open up channels within you, your ability to feel more, your ability to see things that you didn't see before, feel things you didn't feel before, know things you didn't really understand before. Um, And I also believe a spiritual practice can then help you eat in a way that also feels better. Like you just Mm -hmm. gave that example of like, I think that's such a great example. Um, But yeah, I I really do believe most things come down to your belief. (laughs) It's it's so simple. Yeah, absolutely. And and really, I think that belief can be positive, but it also can be negative. You know, if we have that belief that we're not good enough, if we have that belief that we'll never look a certain way, what we believe we can do, we can. What we believe we can't do, we can't. Yeah, it's like the same thing where I said I tried for 16 years to have a certain body size and like be at a certain body weight. And it's because the whole time I thought it was unattainable. I thought it was like this magic secret answer. 
And I mean, that's also a big part I got out of nutrition and into mindset is realizing, oh my God, there, there really is no answer. And then learning to apply that way of being to other areas of your life of like, okay, now I believe this. And as long as I listen to my body, like my weight stabilized, like I know I will never be obese again. I I truly believe that from the bottom of my heart and I don't even have to think about it, but it's just the belief. It's insane to me how much belief works. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's very apparent in the work that you do where it's very much around mindset. It's the mindset of how can you see yourself to be a certain way instead of picturing yourself as where you currently are. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big part. Like I have a program I'm launching right now. She's a 10. I have like a weird way of approaching mindset. So a lot of us approach mindset from, I mean, typically affirmations and reminding yourself who you are and thinking in this certain way. And I do believe in that stuff a thousand percent. I also believe that it's really hard to shift your mind and to think and believe differently Um, If you don't have one of these two things, one, some sort of experience that leads to a somatic release of energy or um, because usually we believe something because something I mean, I'm sure other people listening to this have heard this before. I'm sure you've heard this before. When we believe something, it's because we had like an oh shit moment in our life or that belief or the negative thing that happened got lodged in our body, our body contorted in a certain way when something happened when we were nine years old, or when we were 15 years old, or whenever. And then that belief was just always there. And it it, it's like this constriction in our body. And so if we keep trying to change the thought, but we feel it, that's why everyone's like, I don't feel my affirmations. And so I'm really big on either one, providing a, a new direct experience that your body can experience and your body can f- physically be like, oh, I don't feel like that right now. That's weird. I guess I don't have to feel this way. That's number one. But another way that I love doing it is, and maybe Ryan's talked to you about this, is we do this... Um, methodology called story work, which involves speaking about a story, but using your breath and really breathing through it and then shifting some of the language. It's a little bit NLP so that they can now feel the story in a different way. Um, I also, I'm also big into a somatic therapy. I'm not a somatic therapist. I work with one. I'm actually going to have her at my next retreat and in my She's a 10 program because it's insane how much can happen when you just learn to like pay attention to the sensations that are already happening in your body. Like if you're a person who rushes around a lot and feels like they have to keep doing and they're not enough if they keep doing and there's never enough time in the day and you feel, I'm just going to speak for myself how I felt when I used to be that person. It felt like there was this like tightness, this constriction, this constant buzzing in my, in my chest. And I felt it all the time, but I never slowed down enough to actually feel through it and have someone ask me questions and reflect to like, when was the first time I really felt this way? And then been able to not act from it and say, oh, I'm feeling this way. I'm going to keep acting, but actually just like sit with it and breathe into it until I cried or something happened like emotionally. And then you're like, oh, I can take my time. Like that, that's what happens in somatic experiences. Maybe you've experienced this too. Like you're led down a journey. You actually feel the feeling. You want to take the action because you want to avoid feeling the feeling or you're trying to make it better. But if you just sit in it, And I find it's a lot easier to do it with someone else than by yourself, um, unless it's like a moment by moment feeling, and then you can shift it, then you'll never be that way again. So, so yeah, that's where I'm big on shifting your belief, but then crazy shit happens when you shift that belief. Like literally, if I try to work myself too hard, and if I ever, my mind ever tries to push me back into that pattern, I will not make enough money in my business. I will, things will start to go slow, stale. I have so much proof now that if I meditate more, slow down, breathe, do these practices, say F it, I don't need to get everything done, I make more money. And it's just, it is so blaringly obvious at this point. It, it just further confirms, oh, you can like listen to how your body feels or slow down to listen to it. You and I are in so much alignment with how we coach because one of the main tools that I use within my coaching program is somatic breathwork. And somatic Mm -hmm. breathwork is all about releasing 
all of that somatic stuff that you've been carrying. And then in the second half of the breathwork session, calling all the parts of yourself back in that left during those times and experiences where you created those patterns or where you took on those limiting beliefs or fears. And then also being able to reprogram the subconscious mind to be more in alignment with what your true authentic expression actually is. And you're right, like, it's so crazy at the things that some of my clients have experienced in their day to day life without changing anything, but just going through these somatic experiences and clearing away all of that stuff that's covering up who you actually are. It's like it just opens up this new world that you didn't realize existed before, but it did actually exist. It was just covered up by so much stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And how are you supposed to shift if you can't feel underneath like what is so it's like this thing that keeps being like, hi, hello. And you're trying to like go underneath it. And it's like, no, hi, hello. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, we reference um, the terminology that we use is called somatic awareness. So mm -hmm. it's developing this awareness around the language that your body is trying to use. But our body doesn't use language in the terms of like words or sentences. It uses feelings, it uses emotions, it uses pain, it uses uncomfort. All of these various different things that come up is our body's way of saying like, hey, something's out of alignment and I'm trying to get your attention. But how many of us go through and well, I'm just going to numb that or I'm just going to ignore that. I'm going to shove it back in the corner and I'll deal with it later. But then it decides to manifest itself maybe as like a dis-ease within the body. And then you're forced to have to recognize that. Yeah. It, and it's pretty insane on like how much you can trust your body to go from disease to ease. I have like a really weird example that I thought of the second you said that. I'm really big on doing the things that make no sense. Like we tried to we try to heal ourselves in ways that make logical sense to us, right? But really it a lot of it makes no sense. It's so it's so abstract. Um, so I had sleeping issues since I was 15. I did everything under the sun, like went to nutritionists, all the doctors, functional doctors, gotten all like the studies. The reason I got into emotional release, I thought that would heal my sleep. And it was like the more confident I got and the more self-actualized and self-assured I, I got, I thought the sleep would resolve and it didn't. And I had this obsession with French bulldogs and I'm into human design. So I'm really big at following like your response, the thing that excites you, regardless of if it makes any sense. I'm obsessed with French bulldogs. So I had an opportunity to get a French bulldog puppy this past December when me and Ryan had just moved and I had just spent all this money and I didn't really have the money or the funds available to get this dog, but it was like such a great opportunity and I don't know about you, Adam, I obsess over things. I'm sure people listening to this can relate. Like when you obsess over something, it's like I obsessed over this dog. So I was like, I'm going to make this happen no matter what. And I got the dog. Literally a few days later, I started sleeping the best I had since I was 15. And it it's lasted. Like I'm sleeping so much better. But it just blows my mind on how it, it makes no sense. And you can really trust your body. You can really trust those obsessions. You can really trust like those desires you have. And it will lead you down a path to a result that you've been wanting to get that you would have never in a million years thought would get you that result. It's like fulfilling that deep down desire that you haven't listened for so long. But in finally fulfilling it, you realize that that was actually the answer all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it makes me think of how people don't do things because of money. And then but they really, like, really want to get something and they keep saying when they have the money. And it's like, well, what if the the thing is the path to get the money? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I, I really believe in I and I always have a saying that I internally say anytime I'm spending significant amount of money, it's mm -hmm. every dollar I spend comes back to me multiplied faster than I can perceive. 
Mm -hmm. And so it's putting it out into the universe that like, because money is just another form of energy. It's no different than physical energy or time or anything like that. It just has a different name and a different construct within our society. But realistically and fundamentally, it's all the same stuff. We have no problem giving out energy by helping somebody physically, or if we have no problem giving out energy by just listening to somebody's problems and helping them talk it through. But yet we can't give money out because we're worried that more isn't going to come back to us when recognizing that just like a river that gets dammed up, it starts backflowing instead of continuing to flow the way that it's meant to. So if we just hoard all of this money and just continue to stockpile and continue to stockpile and continue to stockpile, you're actually slowly stemming how much more can flow to you because you are saying that you're not willing to allow that flow to actually go through you yourself. Yeah, and that's when people say they are stuck they're frustrated, all of those things. And it's like, oh, I know you're stuck in frust. Sometimes like when I hear those people who just like want to come to my retreat, for example, but the money is keeping them back and they feel so stuck and frustrated. I just want to like grab them and to the other side and be like, just come. That's where I think um, what you do in breath work and somatic therapy and getting into your body is so helpful. I think the more people get into their bodies, the more they're willing to take those risks and leaps because it creates that solidness within you where you're not relying on the money to create the solidness, but you are solid. Yeah, it's it, it all about empowering the individual, like mm -hmm. recognizing that by saying I'm not willing to spend that money to get this experience that I know deep down is going to give me a drastic shift, is going to help me move and evolve in my life. You're giving the power away to money mm -hmm. instead of recognizing that okay, just find a way. Life always finds a way. Yeah, we enslave ourselves to other mm -hmm. things, to outside things. I can't do this because of this. I can't do this because of that. It's like, oh, if you're the one enslaving yourself, you're the only one who gets to free yourself. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And have you found that working with human design has really helped you kind of create clarity around how you want are designed and therefore how you need to design your life in order to be able to continue that evolutionary process? Yes, a thousand percent. Yes, I love human design and I love it in a way that I think most people don't use it as. And I get it because when I first got into human design, I wanted to learn all the things and all the intricacies and, and like get a million readings and hear all these details about me. And I've found the most empowering part about human design is getting one reading, knowing the basics about you, forgetting the rest, and then just tuning into your inner authority and your energy type and just experimenting with that. Um, I find that that more than anything builds the self-trust. I do think it's important to get at least one reading with someone because often I find, because I've also found that human design readings are highly accurate. I'm also really into the gene keys, but I find that, oh, you got the gene keys book right there. It's That's literally hilarious. right on my desk all the time. Well, it's very empowering. It allows you to take a breath and just like lean more into you. So in human design, I found that when I've given people readings, often something that I bring up that's a part of their design and who they are is something that they reject about themselves or mm. they were taught not to like about themselves or um, they think that's one of their faults. And so having something tell you, no, this is like your part in the world, like you, you get to own this, like this is your gift. It completely reframes the way they look at a piece of themselves and <sighs> they can take a breath and like have some self-acceptance. And so I find that to be important. But once you like find the self-acceptance and the little things, like you don't got to think too much about it. Go back into presence, get back into the present moment. Um, at my last retreat, we actually read everyone's gene keys and wow, talk about permission slips for those people. Like just such a big permission slip and 
it's also a permission slip to make your life easier in a lot of ways. Like just be you dude and it works out. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that those are the things I've really come to love about it and also following the energy type and how you best use energy. Uh, one thing that I always want to note on any podcast for anyone who's into human design, because there's a lot of manifesting generators and generators in the world is I find that they get confused and think because they have the life force energy, they're supposed to work 24 seven. That is not what it means to be a generator and manifesting generator. You guys are meant to be in flow. You're meant to keep like a running list of things to flow into, but it doesn't mean that you have to keep working and doing. You do the things that provide you pleasure, that like give you the next spurt of energy and the things that drain your energy, which could be working too much, like 24 seven, that's not you being in alignment with your design. So I always feel the need to say that since those are the uh, biggest energy type. And I think that's like the biggest misconception. But understanding that alone gives generators and manifesting generators also permission to stop doing all the time. Mm. Um, I actually had a girl who came to my retreat and she's in my goddess mind and she's a projector. And she actually sent me a list because she's been following her strategy, which is to wait for the invitation and she sent me a list of all the times in her life that she's waited for the invitation. And they're the only things in her life that had staying power that actually worked out. And she was telling me she's working less than ever. She's a projector. So she's not using that much energy during the day. And then she just got like a raise by her work. And she's like, it's the most money I've ever made. And I'm not doing anything <laughs> like that stuff just blows my mind. Um, so, yeah, I'm so into human design and the gene keys. I love that you clarified that. And I really, really enjoy the fact that because I've talked with a couple of people who are really into human design and then I've also talked with a couple of people who are really into the gene keys. And it's almost like they get on these kind of like camps of like it's one or the other. So I really, really love the fact that you incorporate both of them and recognize that both have power within one another. And I have the belief that you need to know both of those things. You need to know what your actual human design is. But then the gene keys, in my opinion, allows you to just dive deeper into more of those subtle aspects of yourself and allows you to gain clarity on where you're lying in your shadow and how you can shift from your shadow into the gift. And then by honoring that gift, that allows you to transcend into the city. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it goes with everything we've been talking about. Like I'm really about, it's everything. It's everything. It's not about one diet. It's not about one divination tool. Like I know a lot about, I know way more about human design than I do about gene keys. Um, because I've done like readership courses and I've become a certified reader. I haven't become a certified reader in the gene keys, but I use the gene keys to help me understand human design in a new way with new analogies in a deeper way. And I think that's what all of life is about is it's just layers of understanding. Nothing is the one thing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I think now is a great time to ask you the embrace and expand signature question. So, Rachel, what did you have to embrace in your life in order to expand into the person you are today? I'm going to go with the gene keys, my evolution, which I'll tell you, my evolution in the gene keys, and this has definitely been the truth in my life, is to embrace the unknown. It's to embrace the unknown and understand the fear of change and actually learn to love change. Um... Yeah, when I that was one of those things that when I read it in my gene keys, my evolution, and it's like, you're here to love the unknown. And you're here to show other people that you understand change is scary. But the more they go into the unknown, the more life's amazing and your heart shatters open and dump uh, diving into the unknown has opened my heart so freaking much. I'm one of the most heart open people I know. I can cry at any moment in time. And I truly believe in a good way, like for meaningful things. And I truly believe it's from taking those leaps into the unknown, which is what I preach. So. Mm. Wow. What a great answer. And I think something that I know in my own life, 
I have struggled with accepting change. And that's one of the reasons that my wife and I moved into a school bus and traveled around for several years, because it forced me to have to confront the constant change and traveling into the unknown, not knowing what this campground was going to look like or what we were going to expect on this boondocking spot out in the middle of nowhere. Will we have reception? Will we not have reception? Is is there going to be a place to park? Is there not going to be a place to park? And it was really challenging for a long time and caused a lot of stress until I finally had to just be like, okay, I surrender. I surrender to this process. Let it be what it's going to be. And that moment that I finally surrendered, it was like every new place that we went just had new beauty to recognize, like new places to explore, new foods to eat, like new people to meet. It's just like you said, it cracks your heart wide open when you can recognize that the thing about the unknown is that it's unknown. And that's <laughs> the beauty in it because you don't know what to expect. Mm hmm beautifully said a thousand percent those were amazing examples yes so if anyone listening to this here is your little encouragement your little nudge that the unknown is actually beautiful so beautiful mm. yeah so are there any last little tips that you would like to give our listeners that could help them embrace that unknown hmm I'm really big on zooming out and looking at life as the long game. And I truly believe looking at life as the long game is the key to embracing the unknown. Because when you do that, you're able to zoom out and realize whatever happens in this moment, it's always worked out. I've always been okay. I will always be okay. And I will always figure it out. And when you can hold on to that zoomed out picture, the unknown becomes safe or as safe as it as it could be. So I'd say that's like my biggest tip. And it's actually the thing I see people struggle with the longest or the hard struggle with the most and something I struggled with for a long time. And I've really come to this conclusion recently that there is no point to worry when I just look at the long game. So I'd say mm. I want to keep it simple and leave it at that one tip. Yeah, that's that's a really great point. And I will take that one to heart because it's a reminder that I need all the time that it is a waste of time and energy to worry. Yeah. Mm. Well, Rachel, so for those of the listeners that maybe would be interested in joining your She's a 10 program that's coming up, do you want to just take a little bit of time to kind of talk about that and the time frame and any of your other offerings that you have going on? Yeah, of course. Okay, so she's a 10. I'm so excited for, and the inspiration came from, because I had a lot of women, so it's mainly for women, so I'm sorry, men, if you're listening, but I had a lot of women come to me feeling unworthy, thinking something was wrong with them, wondering why they can't get clients, or wondering why they've never had a boyfriend, and... I can like feel it so clearly. I've always been the relationship expert out of my friends. Like I've just always been naturally so good at relationships and I've always understood a certain concept that you have to have about yourself that attracts and it's really believing you're the prize, that you're a 10. And I truly have always felt that in romantic relationships. I haven't always felt that in other areas of my life. Now it's, I've now transferred that energy to my business and now it's transferring to other areas of my life. But I've really come to realize, especially when, when women come to me and I want to shake them and tell them it's not that you're not worthy. Like there's actually nothing wrong with you. It's the fact that you think there's something wrong with you and you don't realize that you're a prize and you don't realize that you are the 10. When you realize you're the 10, you hold all the cards like you're the gatekeeper. Other people aren't the gatekeeper for you. Opportunities aren't the gatekeeper for you. You're the gatekeeper. You take that ownership and that control. And so there are so many tools that have got me here and allowed me to feel this way. And so throughout the program, we're going to be doing a lot of things we talked about in here, diving into people's human design, diving into their somatics. I have my somatic therapist coming on to do some release work, doing some like Kundalini breath type stuff too. 
but it's also really about community building and being around strong women who are doing it with you. I will say at my last retreat in Virginia, people tend to get naked at my retreats mainly because I'm so comfortable being naked that I help other people feel comfortable being naked. And this one girl uh, has always had body image issues and uh, she was in the beginning of the retreat, she said she was not gonna get naked. And then by the last day of the retreat, we were all in the hot tub and she's like, fuck it, I'm gonna get naked and get into the hot tub with you guys. And she did. And throughout the whole experience, we had sensual dance movement classes, which are also gonna be in She's a 10 because I truly believe when you learn to tap into the subtleties of your body, you naturally move sensually, you naturally move sexy. And then you realize how sexy you innately are. And so like throughout that retreat, we were also reflecting to one another, wow, you look so good. Like, damn girl, that was amazing. And there wasn't fake compliments. It was truly like, like you look really sexy when you move like that. And so her also getting that reflection throughout the retreat and like taking all these big risks, she said she has never gotten that before and she's never felt better or more confident in her body. And so I'm really big about also within the container, building a really safe community um, who feels safe to be vulnerable. And I call it like getting emotionally and physically naked in order to build confidence. And so that's going to be a big part of the program as well. And I, I think it's just one of the things I'm really good at is helping women feel really safe to get naked, uh, like physically and emotionally. Um, so yeah, that's going to be the program is really stripping down all the shit so you can feel your authentic, true expression, feel like a 10, own your worth. And then as a result, so within, so without, you do end up attracting the men. You do get the clients and in, in all of those things. Um, but yeah, that's that's the program. We start June 1st, and I'm so freaking excited. What a beautiful program. Well, I'll make sure that this podcast gets out there in time for people to be able to sign up come June 1st. And... I just wish you the best of luck with everything that you're doing because it's such amazing work, Rachel. Oh, thank you, Adam. Sounds like you're doing amazing work too. So I'm grateful to be connected. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your wisdom with the listeners. Um, I know I'm speaking on their behalf that it, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you everybody for listening to another episode of the Embrace and Expand podcast. As always, I will have Rachel's information down in the show notes below so you can find out how to contact her, follow her on Instagram, and sign up for her She's a 10 program if you feel called to do so. So thanks again for being here. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you on the next one.